Hi everyone, this is Lori LeBay, founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. And today I'm gonna to do something a little different on the radio show. I'm taking a, a piece that I did on Dementia Chats, which is a video interview where I interview those diagnosed with dementia. And our topic was responsible media. I think you're gonna find it fascinating. So I hope you enjoy it. And welcome to Dementia Chats. Today we're gonna to have a really interesting conversation. We're gonna be talking about the responsibility that media has to cover dementia and cover it in a fair and positive light, especially when we're we're having all this conversation about dementia-friendly communities and dementia-friendly businesses, we would like to see dementia-friendly media as well, giving a true and realistic, I guess, message to help reduce the stigmas and lift spirits that there still is life with dementia. Before we get started, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves, and I'll just start. I'm Lori LeBay. I'm the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. My mom had dementia for 30 years, and that is why I started trying to raise everyone's voice and get this conversation going. I just felt a, a super huge need for that. Plus, I found that my mom and others with dementia had brilliant insights, and I kind of thought it was asinine we were tapping into that. And so we will go and introduce everyone now. So, Bob. My name is Bob Savage. I was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's about three years ago. Uh, I'm uh, as much involved as much as possible in doing advocacy and trying to reduce stigma. And Mary? My name is Mary Rudnofsky. I have a condition called subcortical leukoencephalopathy, which is a rare uh, inherited disorder. It's, uh, I'm a former college professor, and so I have kind of the absent-minded professor syndrome. And I'm also an advocate for the human rights of people with uh, dementia. Wonderful. Thank you. And Harry? My name's Harry Urban. I live in Pennsylvania. I was diagnosed over 14 years ago with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. I'm a uh, Purple Angel ambassador and a sentiment ambassador, and I created a Facebook dementia support group called Forget Me Not, and I'm a strong advocate for the dementia community rights. Great. Thank you, Harry. And Lisa? Yes, I'm Lisa Head, and I was diagnosed with early onset dementia in October of 2017. And so I started a YouTube channel to show people that uh, we're still people that are very productive and part of the community and that um, we don't all, all of a sudden need to be put in a closet or hid away. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. Bill? I'm Bill Walsh, uh, more formally Dr. William Walsh. I'm, I'm an allergist, uh, retired. Uh, I have uh, Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately. I have known that since 2015, although in retrospect, I know that I've had it for years before that time. My family's been severely affected by it, too. I uh, am an author of a number of books. Uh, as an allergist, my, my earlier books concerned allergy, but my most recent one concerns Alzheimer's disease. I am hoping that I can teach people how to live with Alzheimer's disease and keep it under control. I have been able to do that for myself. In 2015, I was at the point where I could hardly talk anymore. Now, as you can see, I can talk an awful lot, <laughs> maybe a little bit too much at times. Okay, great. Thank you, Bill. Michael? My name is uh, Michael Allenbugging. I am an international dementia advocate who is living with dementia. Wonderful. And Elon? My name is Elon Caspi. Uh, both of my grandmothers had dementia. I'm a gerontologist and dementia behavior specialist. I'm here to uh, learn from your lived experience and contribute to what I've learned in my experience in uh, nearly 25 years in the Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to go and start with Mary, if you don't mind, on this topic of responsible media coverage. And what are your thoughts? What have you seen? And what would you like to see changed? Thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, the thing that touches me the most viscerally is the message where it's you see in the advertisement that these people are all waiting for the first survivor of Alzheimer's disease to somehow magically appear through some pharmaceutical intervention. And while I think it's important that we all look for some sort of a cure, the problem is twofold. First of all, there are 
literally hundreds of different diseases and sub diseases that lead to dementia. So there can't be just one cure. Main other problem for me is that a cure is always looking to the future and it's not going to affect me today. It's not going to affect me in my lifetime. And I still have to live and I want to live. And so I need something that's going to improve the quality of my life, my happiness, my safety, my comfort, my ability to find joy in the journey, as our sweet friend Susan used to say, and to be able to practically get around in transportation and doing all of the practical things too. So we need more social interventions and less pharmaceutical looks to the future, something to live now. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, Lori, I'm going to have you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lori Sher, and I'm a very strong advocate for people living with dementia. Wonderful. Thank you. Michael, I'm going to go to you next to see what your thoughts are regarding the media coverage, because you, you've had a lot of media coverage over the years. I got to tell you, Lori, I, I just wrote an article. Uh, I'm actually waiting to get it published. It, the title is, What Pisses Me Off? And that's exactly part of the problem is you, you have so many people who are living with this disease and there's so much stigma around this disease that needs to change. And to, to be honest with you, I blame government uh, because the government is not doing anything to portray what people with this disease really are like. And they're not trying to help in any way with the stigma. Uh, and, and that's a real problem because while we're finally getting the funding that we need to get, which is fantastic, I mean, we, we, I don't know if you folks know, we've just reached $2.3 billion. It's sitting on the president's desk right now to be signed. So the money aspect of it is finally being taken care of, and we're finally going to be getting more money in the following year, so that's great. But nobody's addressing what we're like today. How do we live life to the fullest, and how do we get, I guess, people to start changing their attitudes of what people with dementia are like. And that, and that's a real key problem that has to be addressed. That's probably what I consider to be the number one issue right now is to address that stigma. I mean, we've done it in less than a year for people with opioids. As you know, we have a huge campaign that the government did. I mean, they've been throwing money at it and commercials and all, and they're making people with opioids seem like it's not a big deal and they should be able to come forward and we're making it seem like it's a non-issue anymore. Well, why can't we do the same for people who are living with dementia? I don't get it. I mean, they were able to do something in one year. They've changed so many people's attitudes, but they don't seem to want to address it for people with dementia. And that is what pisses me off. Well, that's a really interesting comment when you look at it in that fashion where a person granted um, with an opioid addiction, you know, has a medical condition. You guys didn't say, oh, let me just dip my toe into dementia and see if I'm going to like this or not. I mean, this is something totally you have no control over and it can hit anybody at any time. And we're starting to see it even affect our children now and in some cases. So I find it very, very interesting that that whole process and I can understand why it pisses you off, as you say, with that. Um, Harry, I'm going to go up to you and then I'm going to go to Lori. I get, I get very upset with the media coverage. I, as an example, if there's a mass shooting, a school shooting, anything like that, the shooter has a mental condition. Okay, so now people assume they have Alzheimer's or they have dementia. And I think the media now is putting people living with dementia into that category. And I think that they're giving a very disservice to us. Another thing that gets me upset with the media coverage is years ago, uh, coconut and oil was a cure-all. Coconut and oil was going to fix everybody's problem. I was one of the ones that came out and spoke out on it and said, no, it's not a cure-all. And I got criticized quite a bit for it over the years. But time has proven that coconut oil is not the cure. Now that the big thing is CBD oil, that's the biggest cure. I get I get so many emails and messages a day. Harry, have you tried CBD oil? That could solve all your problems. The the hype around that, I mean, they, they, they have these, when I think of a cure, I think of false hope. Okay, whenever something comes out and says this is a cure for 
the Metro, this has promising things. I put that under the category of false hope. And I think false hope is worse than no hope at all. Thank you, Harry. I blame most of it on the neurologist for the stigma, for the drug. And the reason is, even with the opioids, who was it that was giving out all the opioids? It was the doc, wasn't the government. It was the doc. And now it's gotten to the point that people that have surgery can't get pain medications because there's such a, a major problem. With dementia, I think it's the same thing. The neurologist are the ones that are prescribing all the drugs. And neurologists are the ones that are telling them that give the media the impression that we're all in a wheelchair and can't, can't recognize people. When the media is reaching out to get expert advice, who do they go to? They go to a neurologist. And what does a neurologist say? Well, they give them the impression that they gave all of us when we were diagnosed. And that is of someone in a wheelchair, not knowing what they're doing, not knowing who they are. So much of that is taken off of the neurologist. I think it's a shame. I would like to see the government put money into training neurologists, forcing them to go through training every year and to spend time with people living with dementia, which is who they're supposedly working for. Good comment. And think that we do need a lot more education, not just for the neurologists, but for our general doctors and nurses as well. I think it's very important to get that education up in the whole medical field. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to go back from my personal experience. One day I was Bob Savage, fairly normal. Next day I was diagnosed. I was one of those. This is before knowing anything about it. And where does that come from? That comes from the pounding of stigma all over the, over the years. People have, practically everybody knows an Aunt Lucy or an uncle had Alzheimer's. And they're really frightened about having it. So they're already frightened. Now we go to all this uh, magic cure, magic cure, magic cure. People get all excited to give them money. And, but I'll echo what everyone else has said. Right now, uh, every day, there are thousands more people already diagnosed. And there are already thousands, and there's thousands more coming. Every day that we don't have the support that we need, right? There are all these people just floundering around, trying to live their life as normal. And we just ignore us. And I use the word they. I was at the, the, the conference in, in Chicago, and there was these uh, two people who were talking, describing the wonderful program they have in, in improving communication between uh, uh, staff and people with dementia. They used they in their conversation 20 times. Wow, I said, good luck. <laughs> they is a terrible word for any stigma. And we are now, or I am now in the category of a they. Thank you, Bob. Um, Bill, I'm gonna go to you and see what your thoughts are about media coverage. I have to confess, I don't really have a lot of thoughts about it. I do read about it. I always read about it with the thought that the person who is writing about it doesn't have dementia and is recording the facts as best they can. But unless you have dementia, you can't really feel as deeply as somebody who does. So I'm not going to be able to give you much of a feeling for that other than I, I'm glad that any time I a, a, a article comes out about dementia that at least it's keeping it in uh, people's minds. Just to piggyback on that, Bill, the fact that as a relative newcomer, you haven't seen enough articles by people with dementia is a statement about the media coverage, because clearly there are a lot of us who are still uh, able to speak and write that if the media wanted to, they could reach us and write a lot more things by us. There needs to be more of that, I think. I think, I'm trying to put this very delicate. I think anybody that that hears us speak, I've been living with all time for 14 years. I can tell you every horror that I went through living this disease. When I'm out speaking, somebody says, Harry, you can't possibly have all time. And I said, why is that? Well, because you speak so well. Now, they don't understand. We are doing a lousy job explaining what it's like to live with dementia. People still think that we can't think for ourselves. We can't do anything for ourselves. But I'm here to tell you, I have many, many friends that will stand up and debate any neurologist around, but we don't get credit for that. I brought that up because just the other day I was given a speech. A man came up to me and, and said, Harry, 
he said that you opened up my eyes. And he says, at first I thought, this guy don't know what he's talking about. He's a fake. And he said, the more he listened to me explain things, the more he better understood. And I said, the only reason I can explain it is because I lived it. I didn't read it from a book. I lived it. I learned the lessons of life. Thank you, Harry. Bob? One of the things I think in the word is fear. Uh, fear and stigma are so closely connected. And fear is, uh, is what we're talking about. The whole thing to get the magic cure is using fear in order to get the money. The other thing, and I know we're supposed to be politically correct, uh, but there's, there is an organization that broke away from a master organization not too long ago. And he's using the money from their walks to provide support to people with dementia. And it's amazing when you read about that, what, what they're able to do. So how can we get the money? How can we get the money to support ourselves? And how can we get the government? And how can we get the researchers or whoever raised the money to give us our share? <laughs> Interesting concept. I, I understand what you're talking about in terms of, and, and I guess I'm okay saying it because I believe this is what you're talking about, is the Alzheimer's Association being the master group. And some chapters have pulled away from that and are wanting to be able to raise their funds and keep it in their community. Right. And that is something that a lot of people know, and it's a lot. It's it's something that a lot of people don't know as well. But I think that that is what you're what you're talking about, and I I think it is each of our duties as citizens to know when we're donating money, where those funds are going, and you know how they work. What I keep hearing repeatedly from people with dementia is a cure would be nice, but we need support now. We need support for ourselves. We need support for our families and our communities so that we can all live better <coughs> together. And I think some. Some of that is starting to occur through dementia-friendly groups, grassroots, through Dementia-Friendly America, um, which probably is a little bit more controlled and structured in terms of where those things are going to go and how it's going to happen. But it's interesting to see the progress that's being made there to reduce the stigma and give support on a local level, but it's not near where it needs to be. Um, Bob, I'm going to go to you and then down to Lori. Just quickly, I want to thank you for that clear statement, Lori. It's powerful. Thank you. Lori? Yeah, you know what? I think some of the educating people needs to come from us. I don't think media is going to automatically reach out to us without us first reaching out and saying, hey, we have a story. And to that, I'm going to point to, I was interviewed by the Reading Eagle and on Palm Sunday a year ago, had a three-page write-up about living with dementia. Then recently, AARP, I was so proud of the stance that AARP took because they showed three very positive, for the most part, the videos of people living with dementia. And they decided to take the stance of there are people living well with dementia. The more we get the news out there, the more we talk to the media, the more we expose ourselves, the more they're going to start picking up on, hey, there is a story here and people want to hear this end of it. So twofold. One, I, sh I, I want to give a shout out to AARP and the three videos they did. And secondly, our responsibility. We need to get more of that out there and let people know our story. And we're working hard to do that just through Alzheimer Speaks chats we get we are starting to get that message out but it doesn't happen overnight we need to continue to push the fight that we've been doing and thank you lori for helping us to push that fight i think the political climate is actually starting to change uh, I mean, I was one of the people who was always pushing for funding. That's one thing I no longer worry about because the funding is now happening and it's going to continue to happen with this bypass budget that we have in place. So I no longer focus on that. And at the same time, I see all the people out there who are also doing the same thing. You're starting to see all these organizations who were once so focused on funding, they're now starting to focus on what we can do for the people today who are here living with it. Things are starting to happen and are happening for the good of us. I think it's more important now than ever for all of us to continue to push and to try to get these organizations along with all these committees that are forming to be a part of them. Uh, because I think they're now starting to recognize that we have to be a part of the process. We have to push even stronger today to make that happen. I so agree with you. And I think, um, 
you know, I liked what Lori said. Oh, I like what all you guys said, but, you know, Lori had mentioned about you guys getting out there more. And, and I know each one of you do that in your own right. But part of, part of the leverage of you guys taking this public stance to say, hey, I'm still me with dementia, you know, I'm, I'm still a person here, is giving others, I think, hope to, that they can live a, a full, well life, and they're going to have to adapt, just like we all adapt to life, you're adapting to dementia as circumstances change, versus that fear of doom and gloom and prepare for the end, because it's, it's all down here from, from now on. And I, I've heard from so many of you over the years what a powerful position you're in and how purpose-filled you feel. And many have never felt that prior to having dementia, but to really stand up to a cause and, and be a voice. And it's wonderful to see the positioning of your voice finally taking hold. Again, it's not near where it needs to be, but people are listening and people are are shocked. I mean, I every time I do a conference, if I'm interviewing, and I always try to get a person, at least a person, if not a whole panel, involved in a conference. And every single time we do that, we will have professionals in the audience ranging from medical to activities to maintenance and administration in there. Every single time people come up and say, I had no idea. I have, I have had this wrong for 20 or 30 years that they've been in the business. That's how profound your voice is in terms of changing people's perceptions and expectations and outcomes in terms of what is possible with living with dementia. And so I, I just give you all kudos for standing up because I know it's not always easy when you're, you know, when you're kind of swimming upstream <laughs> against the current. So um, Elon, go ahead. So most of us know Dr. Uh, Richard Taylor, the late Dr. Richard Taylor, who was a, 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 a leader, a visionary, courageous, charismatic, outspoken leader in our field. And he left a huge legacy. And part of his legacy it, it was um, shared in his DVD, Living Outside the Stigma. And it's one of the most powerful DVDs I've, I've watched. And I, I think that what he shared in that story was that when we first learned about his diagnosis, he was so fearful. He said he cried for three weeks and he explained exactly what you guys are describing, that it was um, shaped by the common perceptions in our society of the negative image of people living with dementia. He talked about a death sentence, a living shell, you will lose your soul, there is no life with dementia, you, you die twice. And he, for three weeks, he was so depressed that he actually started writing his memorial service. Then he shared it with his brother and his brother said, had the common sense and the wisdom to say, you may need to plan your future, but this is too, too early. There is life to believe, you know, you, you, you could still live well. And that was, that was, uh, from what I recall, it was a turning point in his perception of his condition. And, and of course that we know that he lived to be a, a leading advocate with a purpose in life. And he, he educated an impact uh, impacted the life of millions of people, I believe. But unfortunately, the topic, you know, the topic today is about media portrayals, responsible media portrayals of people with dementia. You know, in, in 2010, the New York Times had a series of articles and the title was The Vanishing Mind. We still have frequent uh, excessive high promises for cure that are coupled oftentimes with stigmatizing messages about people living with dementia. I believe that there's important distinction between real hope and you know, realistic hope and unfounded hope, or, or, or as, as, as Harry mentioned, uh, called it um, uh, false. And it has tremendous negative impact on many people with dementia. There is an organization out there that is a watchdog of journalists and media organizations, and it's called Health News Review. And they're actually, right now, they just came out with one piece was published yesterday about it, as well as they're working currently on a podcast uh, about the harmful effect of negative portrayal of people with dementia that is often coupled with promises for cure. I think, you know, we, we need to probably write a white paper by people with dementia to stop that, to, 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 to express your concerns about those messages in a unified ma manner, in a coherent manner, to send a clear message that this is unacceptable because you are the ones who set the standards 
nothing about us without us, an authentic partnership. Thank you, Harry. We do have a story to tell, but we don't have the means to tell the story. Now, we can talk to local groups, tell a story, and it helps a couple people. But I want to tell you a little story. A couple weeks ago, I asked my friend, Laura LeBay, if she would do an interview with my Sentimenta friend. And she agreed to do it. And we discussed the Italian approach to care, dementia care. Now, she recorded the interview. That is being shown all over Italy. I get I get messages, email from so many different cities in Italy asking me about that. Now, that is that is an example of the positive things that the media can do. If Laura LeBay can do a show that is being watched in Italy by thousands and thousands of people, we're reaching out to those people. Now, we try that here in the States, and we get a different reaction from people. Okay, first of all, it's just the stigmas that we carry here in the States. Over in Italy, people living with dementia don't have those stigmas because they approach it differently. Roy, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of the heart for the things you do. Thank you, Harry. Um, Mary and then Bob. Just to correct a, a slight, perhaps, misconception, Harry, in Italy, people with dementia have a very heavy stigma. Unfortunately, it carries such a heavy stigma still that most people do not get diagnosed. When they go to their doctors, the doctors don't even give the person the diagnosis for believing that it's in their best interests not to know the diagnosis. So it's the very few people who have come out and are starting, really starting. They're very far behind us in some ways about talking about dementia and having it be something that's an openly discussed because it is still something where people are kept behind closed doors, kept inside and and hidden. Yeah, but Mary, we have we have the same problem here. How many African Americans do you know speak about dementia? Because their culture won't let them do that. The backbone. It's the same way with Hispanics. It's the same it's the same thing. But over in Italy now, they are more responsive to hear what people living this disease has to say. Because we are opening up their eyes. They're not, they have a different approach to it. And that's the only thing that I, I'm trying to really push is they have a different approach to dementia care. It's not the old approach, not the old approach they have. It's the new approach that do really push it. And probably like um, much that's happening here in the U.S., there's a lot of people still working on old theories, <laughs> but there's a lot of new ones popping up. And I think everyone in this group will agree that one thing isn't going to work for everybody and you, you really need to build that toolkit. But the toolkit is expanding and there are more resources. So Bob and then Michael. Why is it that people from Italy are responding to your show and people from the United States I'm guessing, from what I hear, are not show, are not response. That's a question that really scares it to me. Well, I don't, I don't know if so much people aren't um, responding here because, I mean, I've had several different companies here and abroad say we'd like to use segments of your, of your dementia chats for training. So I think it's being heard, but again, we have to remember this is a new shift. I mean, I've only been doing this nine years. And nine years some days seems like a really, really long time. And other days it feels like it hasn't been much time at all. But in those nine years, especially in the last five years, I I've seen a huge shift. I'd like to ask Harry the same question. Harry, why do you think that the people of this country are not responding? Because they're not listening. And they, why is that? They, they have their minds closed. They already made up their minds on us. There's, there's so many people from Italy write to me, Harry, I love you. You know, now, here in the States, we would never talk like that. You know, we don't talk on the emotional level because we, we, weren't, we weren't brought up that way. I get so embarrassed because they call me their master. And it, uh, it, it it's kind of embarrassing for me because I don't understand what that means. But it's, it's, it's someone, in their eyes, it's someone that they they can learn from it's like the old it's the old the old Indian 
person in an Indian tribe and the chief that has all this knowledge and people respect for this knowledge he has. Um, now, here in the States, the first thing they want to do is they want to discredit you for what you're saying. They don't want to listen to what you're saying. They, they're, they're out to discredit you to prove you wrong. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, I've been fighting that for 14 years. Why is that, Harry? Why is that? Why is it that the, we're, we're, this culture is so anti? Because I think they're afraid I'm right. So what's the first step we take to change that? It is, like Corey said, times are changing, Bob. More and more people are listening to what we're saying. At, at, first, <laughs> at first, you have to get their attention before... It, it, it's like it's like a dog. If you want to train a dog, you have to get their attention before you can train them. If not, they, they think you're playing a game. And that's the way it is here. We have to get somebody's attention so they hear what we're saying. And a lot of people, I know, when I'm talking, and I'd like to look out at the crowd, make eye contact, because I know who I'm connecting with and who I'm not connecting with. The person just sitting in the back, they're just carries up, blah, 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 blah. They don't hear a word I'm saying. But a lot of the people that make is eye contact with me, they know what I'm seeing. And every now and then I see a little tear come down because they recognize what I'm see, what I'm saying. They know what I'm saying. They feel it. Thank you, Harry. Michael? It is changing. I, I, I have to tell you, 10 years ago, I remember fighting with conferences, bring people on with dementia, and they, like, laughed at me and, like, thought, what are you, crazy? Over the past two weeks, I've had three different conferences reach out to me who want me to speak at their conferences. I got to tell you, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm literally thinking of turning some of these people down because I don't have the time to do some of this. But this... It's just showing me how things are starting to change. And while they're not willing to pay me to be there, they just want a video that they'll be able to show. But I, I expect in the next year or two that they will want to pay for people such as myself to be there. So it's slowly changing. And these are medical doctors that I'm, uh, at all these conferences that I'll be at. So I think things are definitely changing for the good. It's happening very slowly. But again, we, we all have to keep doing what we're doing because it is work. I, I agree with you, Michael. And I think why it's working, it's because it is passionate and it's on that emotional level and it's not going away. I think of even when first brought the, the concept of the memory cafe over to the U.S. I mean, people tried to shove that down and say it wasn't going to work and they weren't going to be part of it and it'll never happen. And you can't have a person with dementia and their care partner in the same room. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And then about three to five years into it, some of these people in organizations thought, oh, this isn't going away and we better get on board with it. <laughs> we, better, we better start doing something because this is making a difference and we need to be part of it. So it, it does take a while. Lori? I think back the stigma that we're so used to of people with dementia being in a wheelchair, not recognizing who they are, etc., has been happening a long time. I remember going to visit my grandmother, and definitely she was living the stigma that we often think of. But I also look at it from the standpoint of, she was in a nursing home, how depressed was she, and how much was the way she was living, how much of it was based on depression, and number two, how much of it was based on the drugs that they put her on. I often think that the stigma that everybody has about how somebody with dementia looks like is really what someone on drugs and depressed looks like more so than what somebody with dementia looks like. Because when they're put away, take yourself and get put away, away from your family and, and in a room where people cry, scream, whatever. You're going to have such a major depression. Depression is going to take over your life and you're going to want a way, you're going to want a form to get away. What's the best way to get away when you can't get out of your surroundings? Sink into yourself. And we call that dementia when in reality, I think it's more of a depression and the drugs. So as we get away from drugging people, maybe they'll have more clarity of mind and the world as a whole will begin to look at dementia a little bit different and realize there's drugs and depression versus 
the reality of dementia. Good point. Um, Elon, before I go to you, I want to go up to Bill. Did you have any, any comments, Bill? Uh, not really. I, I do appreciate what everybody's saying, and I, and I think it's very true. I, I think that the more that dementia is being discussed, the more that people realize it and uh, will respond appropriately themselves. I, I have great faith in the American people. And in any people, I don't mean saying just American, but German and other types of people too, that if given a route to get out of that, they can handle, you got to dementia, that they can handle themselves, they'll do it. So much of what I have learned about dementia came from my patients. And uh, I find that that's very, very helpful. I, I see what the point that others are making that it is good to get this information out to people with, you know, of, of dementia and, and what it does and what the life of dementia is like. And that it doesn't have to be so disturbing. It doesn't have to be so depressing. You can live a life and enjoy yourself with dementia if you know enough about it. I um, am deeply concerned about that myself. I, I, I have always found my patients to be my best teachers. Thank you, Bill. Um, Ayla? So, you know, we've been, we've seen in, in the last several decades, very large number of people protesting in the streets around very concerning issues, you know, and, and phenomena in our society, racism, sexism, and other isms. But I don't remember the last time there was, and, and there's, there's some protest about, you know, older adults, and we need a hundred times more you know, with regards to ages, but I haven't seen a protest, literally hundreds of thousands of people across the country that are gathering to minimize the negative effects of dementism. Dementism is very, very harmful. It's the discrimination of an entire group that have a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. And we are excluding you guys, and millions of others from our society. And I think that it's time to consider uh, doing something like that uh, because cosmetics will not, do, will not make the cut and you guys don't have, you know, you don't have all the time in the world uh, to wait for that. Uh, so I think that dementism should be uh, elevated to the level of other isms in our society as a very harmful discriminatory uh, policy and practice in our society. If we are truly committed to dementia-friendly society. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, I think that, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that when, ex when, when people who consider themselves as experts about people with dementia, even though they don't have dementia, go and speak and they receive substantial amount of compensation, um, I think that people with dementia as a group uh, should demand to be compensated because you are the real expert. So why is it that a neurologist or an academic or a, or a professional receive th thousands of dollars to give talks? And um, I don't know the extent to which you are being compensated for your professional services in educating the public and professionals about what it actually means to live with dementia. Good point, um, Alan. I'm going to go to Bob and then up to Mary. 20 years ago, Mental health people were put in asylum. I think right now a, a lot of people with dementia are put in asylums, but given it's much more comfortable than the old asylum. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a term that keeps going on in my mind. I, I live here, and you see these wonderful ads. How many thousands and thousands of people with dementia are locked in somewhere? How many? That's, so I'm hoping, you know, it, it, it changed in mental health, but it took centuries. And I see, I'm hoping it could change now. Thank you, Mary. The, the point that Elon makes about, and the others make about discrimination and ageism and dementiaism is, is well taken. And as I look at the treaty, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we know that such discrimination is illegal. Um, the United States has signed the convention, and so we are morally bound, but not legally bound, to its principles. Nevertheless, we have the 
Americans with Disabilities Act, which is also of the same ilk in protecting us against discrimination for any kind of disability that we have. Dementia is a disability according to the World Health Organization, so we know that we are protected under it, in theory. The problem comes when we have to come to practice as to actually what can we do when we are confronted by the discrimination. And there are procedures that we can go through. We can actually have recourse through the United Nations if we want. It's a long procedure, but under certain circumstances, it's worth it. And I think it might take eventually a case that goes to the Supreme Court to test this kind of discrimination so that it becomes visible enough. If that's the kind of media and visibility attention that we need for integration that that integration had, for example, in the 50s, or that LGBT rights have have, have had in recent years. Things need to get to such a critical point that that's what will attract the media attention. And we have to have that critical mass. And the concept that I focus on the most is this uh, human rights because I think that there's still such a misperception about people with dementia that we are diminished humans, that we are less than our former selves. And the words matter. We are a shadow of our former selves. We're a shell of our former selves. All of this language, which gets used and still the suffering from dementia type type language that gets used is going to continue to work against us until our voices get louder. And I say, keep on telling people that once human, forever human, because that's what we need to keep getting across. I'm still just as human as I was 10, 15 years ago, and I'm still just as human as you are. Thank you, Mary. One of the things I'm going to throw in, and then I'm going to go to Bob and Lori, is uh, to me, one of the big differences with dementia is how it's been categorized. And uh, from day one, it was looked at as a terminal illness, a short-term terminal illness, which is still what a lot of doctors are saying. You know, you're not going to be around very long, so get your papers in order. And that was the mentality. And I look at the other, uh, you know, kind of categories. When you look at disabilities, you look at developmental disabilities and how they build bridges and how they support them to live to to their fullest capability. I look at chronic illness, which when I think of chronic illness, and maybe this is just me, I think of managing pain or or managing um, the disease process itself, controlling it. And I don't think the disabilities or the chronic portion have really been looked at when it comes to dementia. And so we haven't been building the bridges. We haven't been looking at it as lifelong support, that this isn't going to be an in and out factor and you're going to be gone in a couple of years. And so if you're going to be gone in a couple of years, we don't really have to invest in you. We don't have to invest in it. And I, I, so I think it's a mentality change that we're going through right now because even with my mom who lived with the disease for 30 years, I was told way back then, she can't have that. That's impossible. There's no way. Well, you know what? It, it was possible. And no, she wasn't diagnosed for 30 years with it because you screwed up and told her it was her hormones for 10. And, but the symptoms were all there. And her brain upon autopsy showed flat out she definitely had various types of dementia. So I think that that is really um, an important thing. But I also think that we are changing it with our voices and by joining together. I also wanted to make one comment on the compensation for you guys speaking. And I could be really off on this, but I think, I think it's twofold while, while you are being asked to speak. One is that they they get that you can and that you do have valid things that people want to hear. And two, I think you're being asked because they don't feel that they have to pay you because their budgets are so tight and they are looking at any resource they can grab that they don't have to pay. And that's not to 
diminish your value, but that is a fact in our healthcare quandary that we're in right now. There aren't funds to support great voices out there. And it's very, very limited. And some of the even larger organizations are talking about maybe they're not going to do conferences, maybe they're not going to do education, and they are going to focus strictly on research. And then we get back to the point of, and where is the research dollars going towards? Is it just a cure or is it for every day? living life with dementia support. So Bob and then Lori. I'm working here with a dementia friend uh, community and um, working with the disabilities organization. What's so difficult is that even though dementia qualifies, there are no specific things identified for them that would convince them that we have a disability. So Mary, this is where you could help us. Are there three or four things? Like I have a meeting coming next week. Are there three or four things that I could identify that other disabilities are getting support for? I, I'll talk with you about that sometime, sure. Okay, good. By the way, it is in the American Disability Act, there is indirect reference to cognitive disability. Um, I forget the term exactly, but dementia is part of the Americans with Disability Act. We just haven't used it leveraged it enough. We haven't because part of the problem is that because we have dementia, it hadn't occurred to us that it actually was a disability until it became being discussed. Uh, and when and now that it's being discussed as such um, and not as stigmatized as it was before, still is stigmatized. Uh, I know that when I've been invited to speak at, at conferences in the past, and I've been invited with doctors or other uh, academics, they have been given compensation when I asked for a very modest compensation, even a third of what the others were, be, were being paid, I was told there wasn't money for me and they would find somebody who would do it for free. So there is a great deal of disrespect even within the dementia community. I agree. Lori? I have two comments. Number one, although I think language is important, I don't think it's the language we use so much as the stigma that is applied to that language. When I dealt with people with physical disabilities and the government changed their wording that you could no longer call someone handicapped, you had to call them disabled. I spoke to some of them, some of them and they said, doesn't matter if the government calls me disabled, handicapped, or crooked. It's not getting me out of this chair. It's the same thing with dementia. Whether they say we have dementia, we have Alzheimer's, we're senile, it's not changing it. It's the stigma that's applied to each of those words that's so important. What we need to focus on is not the words that are being used, but the stigma that is apl being applied to that. That's number one. Number two, as long as we as people living with dementia allow people to have us speak and not pay us, there's no reason for them to pay us because the expectation is that they don't need to pay us. So when we start saying, you need to pay me, and all of us or many of us stand up and say, I won't do it for free because I'm worth more than that, then it's going to continue to be expected that we're not worth anything. Good point, Michael. You had a comment? Yeah, I, I think the problem you have when it comes to trying to get payment, believe it or not, a lot of these people who go to these conferences and speak, a lot of them pay to actually be the speaker. So it, it, it's a tough situation because I hear you, but I think to get the messaging out, you have to, I, I've thought about that. Because I, I've told so many people that I, I'm not going to speak unless you pay me. And they say, well, sorry, they, they don't want to do anything. So it's like, what's more important, to get the money or to get the messaging out? And I mean, if we all stuck together somehow and maybe none of us spoke, that would probably work. But I just don't see how we can get there. You have to look at the conference, though, Michael, because that depends. There are a lot of conferences where people pay to get on, pay to speak or they do it for free just because it helps to boost their business or whatever. But there's a lot also where people are getting paid and yet we're expected not to be. And that's what has to change. Agree, Harry? On the flip side of that, um, I am totally against 
people making money off of our disease. Now, I can see us being compensated for a time. A lot of conferences don't like to even compensate or for expenses. I I never make a nickel on any time I, I speak. In fact, I end up spending a lot of money with motel rooms and things like that to speak at an event. And if they would just pay our expenses, it would be it would be so nice. But as far as somebody making a business out of speaking of dementia, I think that's wrong. I agree that we sh- this is not a means of of making a career, of making a business. We don't want to do that. Um, I spoke down in Philadelphia. Uh, it was a three-hour drive for us because we hit traffic. I ended up going through a full tank of gas. I had to pay someone to come and watch my dogs. Plus, I had to stay at somebody's house. It was closer, so I didn't have to get a ride back that night. That's wrong. Um, yes, we want to get the message out, but I still had food. I still had to get somebody to come and stay with my dogs. I should be compensated at least as well as other people that are giving up their time and have to have somebody watch their dog or drive them there or whatever. I ended up paying a driver 40 bucks to bring me home. I didn't get reimbursed for that. I will not do that again. I will not incur my own expenses because I'm living on disability. I don't have the extra money to put out. Um, so I, I think we need to look at that. We're worth more and we're living on disability. We should not give up other things because we're spending our money to, to speak. And that message needs to get across to people. We're asking you to at least cover the expenses that we're going to incur. Bill, you raised your hand. Yes, I do. I, I thoroughly agree with the people who are talking about when they give talks and these talks are worthwhile. They're not being paid. Unfortunately, you also mentioned that the money is not available. Uh, I myself have the unfortunate of being able to talk without being paid for because I can support myself on that. But uh, the people that I'm with here are all people that should be heard. And it's beyond my thought to think that they should not be compensated for their time. They, they should be. Everybody needs some extra money. It's a pretty common problem out there. The other thing that I will I will throw out just as a, a professional speaker and trainer myself is that when you start out speaking, you have to prove yourself. And so it can take years to get to that point where people see your value. Because I think part part of what I think that people believe is they're still not sure about the value and what, what are their audiences are going to get. Because in the back of their mind are still some of these stigmas about what it's possible that you can even do. And two, I think the other thing is, well, they're on disability or they're retired. And so they they don't want extra money because that's an easy belief to have to offset their guilt for not paying you too. So I've, I've heard both of those comments out there, but it does, it does take time. And again, you guys are kind of in some ways fresh faces to the stage. And so you're in a really powerful position. And I think you've done an amazing job in terms of people understanding your value yeah and there's there's also the fear that you might be valuable today but in six months when we have the conference are you going to be having as good a day are you going to have a bad day and therefore you're not valuable that is a fear it's a really really good comment go ahead Elon. so i know that in alzheimer's disease international conference there were a lot of speakers who live with dementia and that's great uh but i've been i've been to a conference that took place in the previous days in the same city in Chicago, Alzheimer's uh, Alzheimer's, um, Association International Conference. And a colleague of mine went through the entire program and there were very few, if any, people with dementia speaking at that conference. And that was very concerning. I think that if you are really committed to the population that you serve, there there are ways uh, or creative ways to enable people with dementia to speak on global uh, forums uh, that have to do uh, with the life of people with dementia. You know, you can give discounts because, you know, I've been in touch with Michael 
Ellen Bogan here, you know, a day or two before I traveled to Chicago to present a poster there. And he said, I, I really want to be there. I really want to be there. And I think Michael's voice should have been heard there as, as well as all of yours. But he said it's too expensive. So why can't the Alcom Association provide a substantial discount, if not for free, for every person with an official diagnosis of dementia if they're truly committed to this population? Why is it so hard? Good point. And I, and I think, you know, even starting with the doctors in the clinics, it, you know, they, they interact with you guys to bring them, to bring you into their conferences, which has been done in very small numbers around the world, but extremely effective when it's done. I mean, the resources are there, but people, people aren't thinking out of the box. They are doing what they've always done. So Mary, any last comments? Oh, I'm just Bravo to what you just said, which is the thinking out of the box is important. And remarkably, people with dementia still have ideas and still have actually really useful, clever, and innovative ideas. Because having lived the disease, we have to be creative to adapt to still surviving and enjoying and thriving in life. So we do need to be asked. We are the experts. We don't always articulate it as eloquently as we used to. But if you give us a little bit of time, you will find that we actually can still contribute significantly to society. And that would be the message that I would hope that people who write about us and portray us would still please get out as a message. Great. Thank you. Michael, any last comments? I think it's important that we all continue doing this, uh, speaking up and all. I mean, I, I can tell you, at, at all the ones that I've been to, I'm usually the highlight, and I'm sure it's the same for all you folks. So I think it's valuable, and somehow they fig- got to figure out to put a price on it. Uh, you know, getting back to what Elon said, I even knew Harry John and Beth Colmar, and I couldn't get there at, at, at a discount, which is ridiculous. I mean, if I can't get there... I know most people aren't able to get there, which really sucks. You know, a lot of it, a lot of the issues have to do, for example, with, with uh, I'm thinking about an old woman who is African-American in a rural community somewhere in the United States who has a story to tell. And she's not even aware that the conference exists, right? So, you know, if you can't make it in, Michael, who can't, right? Harry, do you want to go next? No, I think I think we got the message out, and I want to hear if anybody's listening. Okay, good. Bob, how about you? Any comments? Okay, I, I just think this is a great program, and like Harry, I hope somebody listens. <laughs> okay. Um, Bill, any last comment? I really appreciate being here. This is my first time. I've given many talks and I'm used to telling people about dementia and what to do about it. Uh, This is the first time I've really had good feedback from people involved in dementia. And some of the answers I've given, I don't think are the best answer, but I just hadn't thought of them before. And I will spend my time thinking my way through how I should answer them in the future. So thank you. Great, thank you. Lori? Um, The conference that Elon was talking about I know of at least two organizations that had submitted proposals to have people living with dementia speak, and both were turned down, thinking it wasn't important enough, so it wasn't on the agenda. That's sad. That is absolutely pathetic that we're doing a conference on dementia, and yet we don't include people living with dementia in the conference, and that needs to change. Other than that, I just want to say it is such a joy and a privilege to be part of this group and hear everybody's voices and see all the faces over and over again. Lori, I appreciate you and everything you do, and like the others said, I hope there's actually people that listen. I want to just jump real quick and just say about that conference, if it was the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference that you were referring to, I have to, to say that it was a, a, a conference that focuses on science and it's, it was heavily biomedical. But that said, again, nothing about us without us. So how can, as Bob Savage now, they, his organization just got a grant, how can people with dementia become authentic partnership and equal partners in research about their lives, priorities, funding, and, and, and pressing issues in your lives? So it is relevant to that conference, despite the, the, the biomedical uh, orientation of that conference, 
in the context of research. I just wanted to point that out. I think one of the things that needs to change is the verbiage we use when we talk about people with dementia. And it's something that, that I try really hard in terms of saying you are the experts. Because in the medical field, and I think this goes for pretty much anything, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, the patient is not viewed as the expert on their own disease. It's typically the medical professionals or you know people who have researched it, whatever. And again, I think that that is starting to change. Um, I think it's changed with breast cancer. I think it's changed with some of the other cancers and things that are out there that the voice is finally being appreciated and, and being heard, but it takes a repetitiveness and multiple people to, to make that, that bar move. And I do feel that the bar is moving. I do feel like there is more respect. And I think the media could really play a huge piece in this if they took the time even to watch watch this. And maybe we should all send this out when it's edited to um, the different media people that we have so that they can hear what you have to say so that they can see you know, what it is you're doing. And a lot of us who have had contact with the media, you know, they already know because they know you as individuals, but to see others, because I think so often people think that you are the exception to the rule. And I think you are in many ways because you are taking a public stance, but in terms of your abilities, I don't think you're necessarily the exception. I think. I think it is, you know, we can raise the bar and help more people live fully, but everybody is going through these struggles. And just like everyone else out there, nobody wants to be interviewed on a bad day. I don't care if they've got dementia or not. And so, and I know we've talked about that in the past too, that when you guys are having a bad day, you, you, you stay home and you're not as public. And that is part of the problem as well, but that also has to be respected and understood that it is more alike than different with, with all people and humanity in general. And so with that, Elon, I'll give you one last chance to, to speak up. You know, I, I just want to uh, do a shout out to a film that called Monster in the Mind. You know, we talked about responsible media portrayals of people with dementia. In 2016, Alzheimer's Association International Conference, there was a screening of the film Monster in the Mind uh, by Gene Carper, who was the CNN first medical correspondent. And in that film, there is a negative stigmatizing portrayal of people with dementia. And this is what Gene said in, in the film. I was one of the media people who became part of the propaganda machine, tell Alzheimer's to the public. And now she's dedicating her work now to enabling people to live well uh, with their condition. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time today. And then to our audience who's listening, please share these. This is why we do them. We really want the voice of people with dementia to be heard. Feel free to share. So thank you again. Bye now. Hi everyone, this is Meredith from the Senior Fitness with Meredith podcast, where I discuss all things for seniors. From fitness, your health and wellness journeys, how to be all over strong and beyond. I also have my mini podcast called Motivation with Meredith. It's a great, quick, motivational pick-me-up for your days. Join me, listen now, search for Senior Fitness with Meredith on your favorite podcast platform.